Today we'll be covering T9, assisting clients using a friendly communication. This session is going to prepare you to communicate with clients in a friendly, kind, and unintimidated way. Being able to manage all kinds of clients, including the ones that are upset, is key for us. I have to understand that not everybody is all warm and friendly when they come into these call centers or physically walk into these facilities. We need to be able to demonstrate active listening. If we're not active listening to the customer and just assuming what is it that they want, that could also be able to frustrate them. As here in the US, nodding and acknowledging that stuff is happening, making eye contact, paraphrasing what the person said is key, not word for word, but paraphrasing and what you believe you understood. Because if you just sound like a robot saying exactly what they just said, be that you may have photographic memory, congratulations, that might actually tick them off. Asking open-ended questions, probing questions to be able to gather, because as we said, if it's a yes or no question, you're gonna get a yes or no. You're not gonna be able to dig into the actual root cause. Be able to explain concept, sorry, complex issues to the user. As we stated, we can't just be talking to them in the technical jargon. As soon as we start spitting out acronyms and or stuff that have no clue what you're talking about, you are gonna frustrate the customer. So we need to be able to, again, be able to speak that customer friendly language where it is up to their level. Next is to be able to list and demonstrate the nine steps involved in assisting an outset client. We have three key principles in client-friendly communication, which is obviously, as I stated, ask, sorry, act, active listening, asking probing questions, explaining concepts in a friendly language. Those three must happen. Obviously, yeah, sometimes we may have some clients that may be able to understand, but we try to match their language. We can't just full blown go into the technical language, assuming that they will be able to understand. Therefore, if it, that person happens to spit out the words from their mouth CPU, I know that I can use CPU. I'm not gonna always say central processing unit. I may say computer to the user, right? They're not gonna understand all the intricacies of a difference from a SATA, IDE, and anything else that's in there. That's for you to know and nothing for them to find out. <clears throat> Sorry, lost my train of thought there. Assisting upset clients and resolving problems before they escalate can help save you time and money. You need to be able to remain calm and make sure that we do not take this personally. It is your fault, so get over it. As I said, just that little sentence by itself hopefully calms you down. You are working for this company. You represent this company. Remain calm. You are at fault, so don't take it personal. Use your, pers your actual listening skills to be able to get to the root cause. Show that you have heard and understood by maybe obviously paraphrasing, ensuring that you're nodding in appropriate time to making the eye contact with that person, expressing sympathy when necessary. Obviously, you're not going to say I'm sorry for everything. Just need to make sure that when it is necessary and it is when the person is very upset that we apologize and or calm down that person. And it must sound sincere the moment that we just say, yeah, I'm sorry. It's Joe again. You know how he is. Doesn't sound from, sounds like if you're actually blaming somebody more than actually apologizing. Next is to find a solution. Start the solution in motion and communicate with appreciation. We need to believe that we work for Disney. I will stick with that until I die. This is one of the reasons why I love going to Disney is because they will guarantee for you to be happy no matter what. Can anybody prove me otherwise when they were in Disney and saw, forget about you, maybe you never had a bad experience, saw anybody having a bad experience in Disney? Have you seen a fight in Disney? Yes. <laughs> I saw a fight, yeah. I saw it on the internet. How long did it last? And you saw it where, I'm sorry? YouTube. Saw, was really no, 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 no. Does it... Oh, that YouTube video. I know what you're talking about. How long did it last? Yeah. I don't know. Like maybe like 
few minutes. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a few minutes until does. the cask until the cask security got got a hold of it. Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen anybody get busted for stealing in you in Disney World? Don't Disney put you World, in, like Disney Jail. Don't they put you in Disney? Yeah. Don't they got Disney Don't jail? Don't put you in Disney Jail. You're darn tootin'. You're darn tootin'. Have you ever seen anybody arrested in Disney though? No, they are nah. the They are the quickest in making sure that any scandal, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It is so quick in Disney World, mind you, because not all the parks are the same, but Disney World itself, the main park, it has several floors under. You never even see a cast member. Have you seen Cinderella getting in with you on the bus? You've seen, if you go to Universal, I'll bet you 10 bucks you've seen the Universal guys coming in and out of the park. You've actually probably seen them on your bus coming in or on the, uh, the boat ride coming into the, to the, the park. You won't see that in Disney. All of them come in through the bottom. The same thing at the moment there is a problem, they'll get rid of you so quick that it's not even funny. You disappear into the nothingness because of the fact that that, that friendly, beautiful, atmosphere must remain anyone know why disney came up with it and how he fell into this why well, disney world or disneyland let me rephrase that why disneyland came into play it's a magical land um... close but i'll tell you it has to do with service i'll give you that much of a clue nobody all right fine Anybody ever go to a fair in your, yeah. in your, in your neighborhood? Yeah. South Florida Fair. Okay. South Florida Fair. Yeah. What what do the operators look like to you? Uh, they look like crackheads, low key sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's his, that was the shock. That's exactly what happened to Disney. He showed up into to with his daughters to a fair, what each which was a ground fair, a big fancy fair, whatever schmo, and then you see. Come on aboard, get on the ride. Rusty all good and God only knows if it's falling apart, ride. He said, this is impossible. I got all this money and this is the best thing that I, he came up with the idea. You have to have it look beautiful. They're all nicely dressed. You go to, again, you go just down the street, go to Universal and I bet you they're not in spick and spam, all buttons in a certain spot and all of them dressed nicely. You go to go to Universal and look at the operators and tell me you don't see a difference. There's even in that town of Orlando, you'll still see a major difference. He believes that you must have proper service, service with a smile, and you must feel like if you're at home, like if it's the most what would it, what's the phrase, the most wonderful place in the world. If you don't give that to these people here in the service, I'll tell you in the service of computers you're gonna have people who are upset. And how can we get this? We're gonna be playing a game now in reference to active listening with our people. You have now heard already and learned how to address a client themselves. This session, we're gonna be able to focus on the art of a conversation. One of these things that we're gonna be learning is itself and being able to listen and being able to understand how do you think your clients know about the types technology you'll be assisting them with anybody tell me overall how much sorry how much do you think i think we covered this a little bit before right we're gonna have a plethora of different ones go ahead and share out uh tech savvy okay newbies new to technology like commercials oh. i don't know mm-hmm you're going to have people who think that they know a lot about computers, but actually don't. And they'll insist that they, they know exactly what's going on, but still demand that you fix the problem their way. Yeah, the people, those are my favorite. The ones that have the solution instead of the problem. Which makes no sense, because if you knew the solution, why are you here? <laughs> but either which way, yeah, those those are the different ones, the ones that are tech savvy, the ones that believe they know what the solution is uh, to their problems and the ones that have no idea. There's, there's several of them. Either which way we should hopefully be 
more or less giving them a same warm and fuzzy feeling no matter who they are, right? So when assisting clients overall in their technology, many of them are friendly and kind. However, you're gonna be dealing with some of them that are very challenging and maybe upset. Why do you think a client might start an interaction with you upset? Their computer is broken. They tried fixing the problem on their own and they got frustrated not being able to figure it out. They could have a non-computer problem they're taking out on you. Those are worse, right? Maybe they're just having a bad day and then they just had it. The latest and greatest iOS just came out. It didn't let me wait. It pushed it. And now look at this piece of junk. Why'd you do this to me? Maybe <laughs> You're going to get like it. Or maybe also like they're going through some, uh, like, um, like say they have to like meet a deadline if something happens. They may be in a rush too, right? Exactly. Yeah. They might have their own stress factors on top of this factor that the actual computer came out and took it personal and decided to die on them when they needed to create that presentation. Why'd you do that to them, Arturo? That's mean. That's very mean of you. And you just have a role. <laughs> So you can see uh, overall when, when you're on a job and you're assisting many different clients and in this session, we're going to be discussing the best way to be able to communicate with them and understand uh, the information you are telling them, ensure that that is in a simple format, learn the best way to communicate with our clients, discuss how to assist the client when they're upset. And we want to make sure that uh, we do our best possible to give them that Disney experience. Gonna be playing a little game here. Actually, stop. I have to be stopped here. And stop my share. I need everyone to either open up Microsoft Paint, get yourself a pen, a pencil or a paper, something to draw with. I need my Picasso's, preferably somebody that can share their screen maybe, or paper that you can share right after, something that I can see. I'm gonna be giving you guys a set of instructions. With these set of instructions, you must listen to what I'm saying. You cannot ask me absolutely no questions. We need to play this game, unfortunately, this way to be able to understand the mayhem if we do not listen carefully. So we're going to be playing the fact of a horrible listener. This is what we're going to do. It's just a person who is listening and assuming at all times that you are correct. No matter what you do, you are correct. I'm only going to give you these instructions. I'm only supposed to do it once. But since we are stuck in technology, I know that it breaks up. And I'll give you the benefit of doubt that if you are unable to hear me, that I will repeat it. I can't though tell you the intricacies of what's necessary to complete this task. I can only give you instructions. Any questions? Because you can ask them now. <laughs> I always like this game. Got a paintbrush or pencil right on the... Up, anything that can help you draw. You're going to be drawing something. All as right. long as you can draw and that you can be able to show that the team right after we finish our, I think there's seven or eight steps, something like that, that I'm gonna be giving you guys. Uh, and then when we finish, we'll all see <laughs> our drawings and then uh, we'll recap and see what we can do better as better listeners. But right now we are gonna play the game of horrible listeners and horrible person trying to talk the worst case scenario of communication. Um, excuse me. Yes. Question. Um, are we doing that on the computer or we get a piece of Which, paper? Whichever is more comfortable for you. If you like to use your computer using Microsoft Paint, draw, whatever, uh, Corel draw, I'm not sure what you guys have, or even a piece of paper if you like. I think it's easier a piece of paper. Okay, thank you. So, so we when you're gonna just tell us to do draw something and then we draw it, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. 
You ready, Picasso? How much paper or how many pages do we need? One. One should be more than enough, and depending how big you draw your your drawing, but it should, it should be able to fit inside the paper. Ready. You'll need the back side of the paper or or another page afterwards, the digital page after that, when we play the good listener and talker. For now, we're just going to play the horrible talker and listener. So I talk, you listen, can't ask any questions. Ready? Step one, draw a circle. Give you five seconds. Hopefully everybody remembers from kindergarten what a circle looks like. Now, step two, draw a line in that circle. Step three, draw two dots in that circle. Step four, draw three lines that come out of that circle. Okay. Now, step five, draw another circle next to the first circle, slightly overlapping the original circle. Then draw two lines connected to this circle. Draw two small lines connected to the first two lines you already have drawn. Can you repeat the last one? The yes, one I can. The last one too. I, I'll, I'll repeat the whole uh, paragraph of step five. So draw another circle next to the first circle, slightly overlapping. Then draw two lines connected to the circle. Draw two small lines connected to the first two lines you already drawn. All right. Step six. Draw another circle step, huh? draw another circle step to the second one slightly overlapping. Draw another circle to the second one slight overlapping. And repeat steps five again. That means basically draw the two lines to this new circle then draw two small lines to those first two lines that we just drew. Hopefully, oh, my brain have, hurts, man. My brain hurts. We should have a spaceship by now, hopefully. You're not even any nothing similar to two lines. Wait, a spaceship? <laughs> <laughs> it, it could be an alien spaceship. It could be an alien. So we, you know, it could be. Something that's not of this world. I'm making it up. I don't know. I, I've had once an alien come out of this whole thing, so I might as well throw it into it. What do we do after the, after the third circle? Mm, after you drew the third circle, you're going to draw two small lines con connected to this circle. Sorry, you're going to draw two lines to connected to the circle, and then two small lines connected to that those two lines. Draw two lines connected to the circle. Then draw two small lines connected to the first two lines already. So those that have a piece of paper, go ahead and hold it up here to the screen so that we could all enjoy. Interesting, yes, expected. Definitely expected. Yours looks like a mountain. Uh, yeah, definitely is exactly what I expected. If Can I share my screen? It, yes, go ahead. Feel free if you have a digital thing. 
My drawing looks nothing like that, by the way. <laughs> Yay, yes. This is exactly it. Yes. Thank you. That's Robert's. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So let me share back my screen real quick. Oh, somebody just went and shared something. That's mine. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no problem. Okay, I'll stop sharing it now. I was a little thrown off at first because in geometry we learned that a line is different than a line segment. Um, and so my line, I was trying to make my lines off the page because lines don't ever end. You are correct. You see how what happens here is in the pre and what we just did right now, if you notice that these steps are so to interpretation that if we're not actively listening and doing our part, we're gonna get a plethora of things that's going on. When I said draw three lines that come out of this circle, we had no idea where these things were gonna happen. Those were the ones that usually just go and make us completely have different types of drawings because of the fact that everybody has a different, I didn't say line segment, like she said, I said line. So depending on everybody's interpretation of what they believe a line is or how long the line is, I never, nobody was able even to give me a probing question, right? They weren't even checking for understanding. It makes it very, very difficult if we're not using the tools correctly, or sorry, the things that we learn in reference to making sure that part of active listening is to be able to ask those probing questions and to maybe repeat that you understood correctly what I was saying. At no point did you have this chance you had to stay quiet throughout the whole process and only assume that you at all times were correct. Had this been a given case where they were trying to describe a problem, you could see that your problem came nowhere close to what I'm saying or to what anybody else is saying, because we still don't know what I is it that I wanted. I'm gonna pause there the recording, the ice cream truck just passed by. Therefore, my belief is that we should go and catch up with that ice cream truck. I'll see you guys in an hour. We'll get started here, guys. Reference to assisting our clients. Who can remember what four steps of addressing a client itself that we started off with? Smile. Anyone? I'm sorry? Smile. That's one. Uh huh. Present yourself. Yes. Offer help mm -hmm. and then thank because That's the client. Right. Spot, that is correct. Smile and welcome as they were coming into your house. Be as sincere as possible. As we noticed, this first one is very, very difficult. These first two, or sorry, these first three steps must come out as sincere as possible. We need to understand that, unfortunately, this gets tedious after so many times we've done it throughout the day. Trust me, I know what it feels like, especially after the hundredth something call in a given day and you look up and you see that queue and that queue still says 90 something on that wall. You're just like saying, is this gonna ever end? Either which way, uh, we need to be able to ensure that every customer has the same Disney ass aspect feeling and where you are as friendly as possible. So after you have greeted a client, it will be time to begin discussing the client's needs. Whenever you are working with a client, there are three separate skills that we're gonna need. As I said, active listening asking those probing questions and explaining the concepts where it's much easier for them to understand. I made it almost impossible for you to understand, especially those that were mathematically inclined and understood what a line was. 
It was on purpose that name or those words were used just to see the different variants of knowledge and understanding of what something is. Everybody's going to have a different idea of what the concept or the, the actual thing is if we do not clarify. Do we agree? Did anybody get the exact same drawing as the other person? No. Give it to mommy. I think we all got a, a, a circle. We could all agree. We all got maybe um, lines in there for sure, right? We could all say we had the amount, the same amount of circles, dots, lines, hopefully. We could probably count that and hopefully we got those right. Now, we're going to play the game where we're going to play active listening the right way. Can somebody tell me what would be a good thing to do when I'm going to give you these set of instructions, flip the piece of paper, open up a brand new paint, whatever you like. We're going to play the game once again. I'm going to be reading out the instructions, but now we're going to play the game of effectively communicating with active listening. Can somebody give me examples of what you should be doing if you're actively listening and doing the three key principles of client friendly communication? Ask you open any questions. Okay. You nod. To understand it. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep eye contact. Okay. Active listening. Okay. Repeat back the thing that you're supposed to do. Uh. Yes, right. So you're asking open ended questions, probing questions to gather the information, right? As soon as you've gathered your information, shouldn't I check for understanding at that point? before I do something about what I'm going to do. I got it. I grabbed it. You answered all this stuff. I'm notating. Should I just now assume that I'm right? No, you should check for confirmation. Right. So we would want to make sure, hey, repeat it back to that person and make sure that in your own words, if you understood exactly what was that they wanted. So there, now we're gonna go and play the game one more time. I believe it's the exact same set of instructions. So let me just go back up real quick. Once again, we're gonna be playing the nice, beautiful, intelligent and active listening people. Feel free to ask as many questions as possible in any which way, and here we go. Step one, draw a circle. Please put it towards the left of the paper, somewhere towards the middle of the actual sheet. How big should it be? I would say all circles are going to be symmetrically the same. At least, at least I would say a, a quarter or more of the size of the actual paper or whatever you're drawing into. Can we ask what we're actually drawing? Not really. That we can't draw. Well, you're, we're drawing a circle right now, and preferably towards the left of this sheet of paper or whatever you're drawing towards. So you're going to draw a circle the farthest left you can on this on this sheet. And approximately maybe all circles will be symmetrically the same, whatever circle that we're about to talk about. Done. We have our first circle. Please put a line in that circle. The line will be somewhere towards the lower hemisphere of this circle. Preferably, if we like to make it as entertain a person who is greeting the customer with a smile. <laughs> so so around the okay, so a, a small a, a small line segment that doesn't touch either of the sides. Agreed, and it should and look like a smile. Or... Should look like a smile. A bended oh. line. So it can be a curve. Yes. Okay. Everyone okay with the first two steps? So we drew our circle somewhere towards the left. Now we're inside this circle, drawing a line on the lower hemisphere of this uh, circle and trying to make it look like a smile. 
If we could please place now on step three, two dots above this line inside the circle, representing hopefully the eyes of this creature. The creature? It's something, How big right? should the dots be? Representing eyes. I will let your leisure of how big your eyes are on that face. So basically a smiley face. <laughs> yeah, okay. it looks like it, doesn't it? it sounds like if it's a, a smiley face. Now, I did forget something. I'm, I do apologize. The line, though, the smiley face, since it is all the way on the left, if we could just please make that line start somewhere around here and the smiley face really, so he looks like if you're looking at his profile, you can only see this part is his lip. So you might have to erase something and obviously it's gonna to be touching that side, the left side. So the line is starting to touch over here, the circle, and it's gonna be more than three quarters of the way. Did that make sense? Uh, yes or no? Hold on, no. So, so, so the, it's, the, Mouth, it's going to be like basically a three quarters view. You're going to be like this. So you should only, the, here's the circle from the left side of the circle, right? The tip of the circle, all the way up to three quarters of that circle. So it's still looking like a happy face. But since I'm looking at whatever it is, I'm going to be looking at it this. I can't see the happy face like this. It's going to be like a happy face like this. Did that sound, make sense or no? Yes, but now we only have to draw one eye or uh, one. No, 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 because I'm still, I can still see part of your face. That's why I see three quarters. Instead of only half of your lip, I'm seeing three quarters of your lips. So I should be able to see that eye over there. And it hopefully helps you align the eyes now, right? Because like the eyes the are not going to be in the center. They're going to be more towards the left, right above the lip. Oh, to the left. Okay. Yeah, so the eyes are going to be off center now because I just told you he's 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 like three quarters of his profile. So I should be able to see his two eyes, which they should be towards the left. In the most likely those two those two uh, dots, the easiest way should be somewhere in the middle of the circle towards the left. The little halfway or three quarter halfway line there on the bottom, right under it. Now. Everybody okay with the circle? Two dots off center towards the left, right? The lines coming from the left is touching the lip over here of, of the circle. It's going three quarters of the way, looking a small little happy face almost. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Now, from this circle, I need you, well, and I just clicked on this thing. Sorry, guys. Make sure I'm, yeah. From this circle, there's gonna be three lines that are coming out of this circle. Now, three lines? No, two lines, sorry. Two lines coming out of this circle. We already did the, they're gonna be up here, like little antennas. Mm -hmm. Please keep the profile, as I said, the guys, like this, right? So if, if the two eyes are towards the left, you should have a dot somewhere over here. And then the other line that's coming out is a little bit weirder because it's coming out of the top. So it should look like if it's on the other side of the head. So one, the, the line I can see is inside the circle coming out. The other one is touching exactly the edge of the circle and coming out. Both of them look like little antennas coming out of the head of this circle. Should, there be, should they be straight lines or curved lines? Curvy G, little lines, yeah, a little bit curvy G. Make them a little feeling like if he's real, a little slight curve. So Got we it. had our circle. We have our line that comes and touches our circle all the way over here. It looks like a little small happy face. We have our two little dots here representing our eyes towards the left middle of this circle. Next, we had the two lines that just came out of the top of this circle. One was coming from the inside, stretches out a little bit. As we said, we wanna kind of curve it towards the front. The other one's touching the circle itself, again, representing that other antenna on the other side. Now, next step, any, any questions on, on those three steps? We're gonna go now in, sorry, I think that was four steps already, right? 
So we drew a line, sorry, we drew a circle, a line, two dots, and the two lines coming out of that circle, right? Next one, number five. We're going to draw a circle to the right of this first circle, slightly overlapping. For those that might not understand what slightly overlapping means, this means that this circle is going to become a backward C because of the fact that it's overlapping the original circle. My original circle stays as an O. The circle that I attach directly next to it, more or less the same size, it's going to look like a backward C touching my original circle. Should it be slightly above or below? We're going to be stretching this creature coming this way. And you can think of it as its thorax or a part of its body. Some type of insect creature. So it will be parallel to the existing circle. And if you'd like to take a little bit of editor's pleasure you can make maybe that circle a little bit smaller to try to make his body smaller than his head or if you want to keep it symmetrically exactly the same it's up to you but it must oh, be that. a backward c touching the original o a now, backward now. c mm -hmm. touching the original o so touching on what um, um the right side of it on the right side of it the right side of it yeah i understand the right side yes yeah. yes okay see this is what you should see right on the right side of it. He should be touching right next to it backwards. It's a circle, but since it is overlapping, I can't see the other part of the circle. Do we agree? Yes. All right. Now, we drew that circle. On that circle, draw two lines coming down. My circle is like this. I want a line like if you look one line coming this way and the other one coming this way. So you're going to have a line going that way and a line going this way. Maybe depending on the size of your creature, I wouldn't make it too big. Most likely, I would say apparently looks to be, yeah, definitely the size no bigger than, than, than the actual inside of the circle. That, what is that? The diameter of the circle. The line is now bigger than the diameter of the circle. So it's going to look like a backward C with two sticks that represent almost like a A coming out of it, like the bottom of an A. You know how the A goes like this? So you're going to see those two lines coming out of this backward C that's coming out. I forgot what football team is Do those that. lines need to be straight? straight lines and approximate diameter of the circle to try to keep the same size of the creature. There will be diagonally one going this way while the other one's going the other way. And it is on the bottom of this overlapping circle. So we got our two sticks that came down. Now you're going to put two small sticks attached to this one. They're both sticks are going to be facing, though, towards the left. Apparently looking like if this guy got some shoes on. So you just drew his legs. Now put his feet. You have that. See, that's like this. We just put the two sticks that came out. Now go ahead and put those two shoes onto that guy. Two straight lines coming out of it, line segments, preferably half the size of the original line segment that we, or less. Unless if the guy's really big footed, that's up to you. At this point, we should have two circles. Hopefully one looking like a little smiley face and the other one looking like some soccer league little logo. I can't remember what soccer league that is, but just play with me. Should look like a C with a, some feet. Yeah. Everybody okay so far? Yep. All right. Now, next to this circle, so we just had this circle, the second circle, a third circle is going to attach itself 
to the second circle, to the right of it. Again, looking like a C. It's going to look like, and this one must be identical to the second circle in size. So if you decided and took the leisure that the second circle is smaller than the first circle, this one must match the second circle in size. And again, it's a C. So you won't see the whole circle. It's going to be touching the other C. Should be your second circle. Any questions on this third circle? Nope. All right. Now, next one. You're going to draw a fourth circle. This circle is going to attach to the circle that was just with nothing. It's just in the middle. So we had a third, uh, a second C that was backward. This is going to be the third backward C attaching to that second cir cir third circle. Sorry. So it's going to be our fourth circle in here. We have a full circle, two backward C, and now this one is a third backward C that's attaching itself to that last backward C that had nothing attached to it except for the second circle. Is it going to be the same size as the exact like the same size as, as the other two? Yes. On the right of the second semicircle guy, all the way at the end. So you should have four circles right now, one next to each other. Is that a true statement? Three of them are overlapping, so they look like three C's in there, backward C's. Agreed? Now, this last circle, the one that we just went and attached to the other circle, we're going to do the same thing to this guy. I want to put that those two sticks that come out that look like if it's like if I'm about to create an A that's coming out of here, and then the two little sticks that come towards the front. Once again, representing the legs and the feet of this character. Can you please repeat the last one? Yes. On the last circle, which is the fourth circle that we're attaching to the other one that's here. So you have this guy, he attached. You're gonna draw two line segments, which are again, the same size as the diameter of the circle. Diameter is from one side to the other of a given circle to be able to keep the exact same size of the creature. Now you have those two legs right under it. They should look like if it's an A coming out of it just the sticks of the A coming out of it, representing the legs. Then from those legs, you're gonna put two sticks facing forward, representing its shoes. Mm. Towards the left. Any questions? Nope. All right, let's try this one more time then. Let's see, can somebody show me their drawing, please? That's mine. <laughs> there you go, that's one. Let me see, who else here on the screen on the recording? Hey, we got, we got it pretty close there. We're getting, everything's starting to look a little bit better. All right. Nice. Nice. I'm going to share my screen share. I see you, Kale. <clears throat> Am I sharing? No. Uh, not, y oh, yeah, I can see your, no, no, that was, that's Fatia. Sorry about that. I can, now I can see it. Yeah, definitely there. There you go. Uh, can, uh, can somebody tell me, do these at all look the same? Did we have the exact same problem as before? Did any of these look somewhat the same? No, no, they're almost all the same, even though there's slight variations. Small variations. I've had a caliper before. Yeah. I like it. Really do enjoy this exercise. Yeah, I think Robert had it. Brilliant. So, how did it feel this time drawing uh, in this activity? Did it feel a little bit different? Much better. Much better. What was the difference overall that made it better? It was directed. Clarity in the directions. Felt more confident that I was drawing what exactly you wanted me to draw. 
Yep. Last time you had us drawing lines all over the place, but this time we knew exactly where the lines to go. So always remember that even if the user himself uh, is you you have difficulties trying to explain something, you have to do your best to try to get them to where you want. You guys have the pleasure of having these remote tools to be able to remote, but just getting sometimes for them to get to the remote in itself could be a challenge. Uh, Active listening requires both parties, as you saw the moment that some of us might have stopped asking questions for clarification, we may get something different. On top of it, if we notice at one point, I noticed that I was giving the wrong instructions to the point that I had everybody recreate their face. And I was as being as detailed as possible on what I needed. I didn't leave it up to interpretations on which way this caterpillar must be facing or ant, depending on what you, it looks like a caterpillar to me, but I'm not sure we saw different people's aspect of what it is, right? What else was uh, uh, useful in here? Anything else compared to last time? We were able to ask questions. Right, isn't it difficult when you're not able to ask questions to be able to even take a grasp of what the situation is? So whenever you're quiet on a call and you're reviewing things with a client, be sure that you're, you do clarify and check for understanding. Repeat back to them and make sure that you clearly understood what they were actually describing because that is one of the, uh, the most problems where we assume we know what the issue is and then solve the wrong problem. Any questions? So, Kevin, help me out here. Active listening. When you're communicating with a client, you don't want to act like you did. What did you do in this exercise that would not be a best practice when talking to a client? Turn and talk and then share out. So if you guys could tell me of scenario one from what I, everything I did to you guys, what is, should I, I not do from the worst case scenario that I gave you? What was the things that I did to you guys? Didn't give clear instructions or confirm that we understood. Right. You just brush past through everything. Like a robot, right? Reading that script that I told you guys about. That's why they're trying to hone down here. What, anything else? I think I was pretty rude when you guys were trying to ask me to, for questions. I didn't, I don't know about you, but I was about to smack them. <laughs> right? it's kind of frustrating when you're not able to clarify things. So we need to understand one of the key things of acting listening is, is obviously to be able to listen, to check for understanding, do those probing questions. And of course, make sure that you summarize what you believe you understand. So I believe here are the major things that we have. We wanna be able to pay attention take notes, interrupt the client to ask only relevant uh, questions. That one's a tricky one. A lot of people tend to interrupt people and they don't let them finish their, their actual sentences. And it may be inside that sentence, the actual question, or they might actually interrupt and ask something that's not even relevant to the actual problem that they're having. So therefore we should always interrupt when there's a pause or when we believe that there is a time for us to be able to ask those questions. Read between the lines. As I saw, some of you might have not understood me in some things, so I tried to make sure that I reinforce and take away the assumptions from you because of the moment that you, you are fully by yourself and I'm disengaged from the conversation and only a robot, 
it creates that problem and we have 500 different drawings. Finishing the client sentences, I don't know. Does anybody believe that one's a good one? You should always let the client uh, finish what he has to say. That is correct. Finishing the, the client's sentence is one quick way of getting ourselves in, tw in trouble. Reading in between the lines again or in some and doing assumptions will get us into trouble. This is why we did this little practice is to make sure that we're not trying to assume, read between the lines or even obviously finish what we believe the person's trying to say. We need to understand that active listening does require us to fully be engaged. We can't be paying attention to anything else. We need to be able to assess the client's level of experience of, with technology. Is that a true statement? It'll help you yes. with language. Assessing the client's emotional state, is that a true statement? Yes. Listen to unspoken requests. No. Yes. Ooh. Like it. I like it. I got a yes and I got a no. Anybody else want to chime? Yeah, I believe it's important. I was thinking it has to do with making assumptions. I think it's just another piece of the active listening part. Just kind of try to put two and two together. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think it's just part of the listening because, like you said, it's not to do more than what you were asked to do to kind of like go overboard, I guess. Yeah, you never know. Sometimes they might be saying something and they're not asking you for it, but they're saying it. And so that's where we where it comes into the play of paraphrasing the part of what they said. When you're doing that check for understanding, you make sure that you understood what they were saying and maybe just go ahead and paraphrase that in there to make sure, is this an actual request? Are you stating that you also have this? They might not have thought that they had that, but we need to be able to listen and understand. They may be explaining something and then throw a, a second issue at the same time to us. We need to be able to decipher, as we stated, we can only work at a problem at a time to the point that sometimes these help desks actually take it literally. You could only call in one problem at a time. That is obviously pro uh, policies and procedures of giving help desk, not everybody's the same. Questions, doubts. Now, why would a help desk though enforce where a user, we're talking about, in, this is obviously gotta be internal. You wouldn't do that to an external customer. Why would I do that to an internal customer? Why would I call a, a, a help desk and then all of a sudden tell them, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to call back because that's got nothing to do with what you're talking about now. Well, if it's someone that we work with, we can kind of better tell them off. Um, Correct, but let, let's think about it again in aspects of a call center. Why would a management team not want to for you to open one ticket for five problems? One user, five different requests, one ticket. Because it's unmanageable later. There's no way I can say when you finish something, what did you finish? You do notice now you have five different things. When you finish the first thing, can you close the ticket? Yep. Now, you just did five things, but you got one ticket. And again, we're going to talk about Billy and, and Bob. Bob went and did 10 tickets. You went and did 10 issues, two tickets. I only see the two tickets. Another reason is uh, the division or 
somebody got to help me with this word, is in reference to security. There is a division in what authority is. I can't remember the security word of it, but it is in reference to your role. You may be able to reset voicemails. He's going to be able to reset IDs. You can probably create an ID in Active Directory. He can probably create a voicemail. I did say that backwards. Permission. Separation of duties. Sorry. Sep separation. I just remember the word. Uh. Separation of duties. Therefore, what I can do compared to what the other technician can do is completely separate on purpose to the fact that is to avoid you going and creating, let's say, an ID, resetting the password, going into accounting with that ID and password and issuing yourself a nice fat check. Why? Because Bob can create the IDs, but I can only reset the IDs. Make sense? Kind of like an accounting where they will always break things up. Like one person can authorize payment and then it has to be a completely separate person who actually cuts the check. Mm -hmm. You can take it even further. You can go to a fast food restaurants or drive throughs You now have one person taking your money and one person giving you the food. Mm -hmm. Because if you were able to do it like they used to do it, <clears throat> you could buy a drink and get a whole meal. Don't ask me, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's dangerous. So they separated the duties because people would do what they didn't or shouldn't be doing. Questions, doubts on this slide? That was a little practice of what is active listening. So the last element, as we said, is to paraphrase what the client says. Can somebody please define what they believe is paraphrase from what we learned? Repeat what the customer said in your own words to show that you understand what they're asking. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Any questions, concerns? Going once, going twice. As she just alluded, please go ahead and read that. I'm sorry, did not catch the name of the person that I just answered. If you could please read this for us. To paraphrase is to express the meaning of what the person said, but using different words. Paraphrasing is the way to achieve clarity. This means that you will reword what the client said and repeat it back to him or her to make sure that you understand not only the exact words, but what the client really meant. This is an important part of active listening. This proves that you are not just hearing the words, but that you are really listening to what the client needs. To paraphrase, you can use phrases like, so what I hear you saying is, or is, insert summary, a fair summary of what you are experiencing. Now we're going to practice demonstrating active listening in a scenario that you have already done once before. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. So now I want you guys to go ahead and take out your two drawings now and then compare your two drawings to hopefully this guy here. By the end of this whole little thing, we could see that compare the first one where we weren't actively listening at all and or using client friendly language. There is a major difference between what we believe and what reality is. Did anybody get anything that looked exactly the same? Because that would be interesting. <laughs> I have mine closed. It's just the curve on the antenna. It's not all the way. Both drawings were almost the same? Oh, wow. Oh, not both. Not both. Uh, we're talking about the last one. Yeah, no, no. I'm saying, it, did your original drawing look like your second drawing? Did anybody have the first and the second drawing almost the same? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, it was, so it does work, as we can see. Active listening seems to be working because we all, on top of it, the majority of us got more or less this drawing. Do we agree? So now I will pass it off to our friends here in our previously program. 
for client-friendly language. All right, as uh, Diego was discussing, it's, you know, it's important to actively listen to your clients and ask them open-ended probing questions so that you can build good relationships. Now, can anybody tell me what is a good example of a probing question with regards to technical support and or customer service? What would be some things you might ask? Like, um, I got a little uh, exercise after this. But what to you is a probing question first? Question that tries to figure out the uh, root cause of something or are you talking... You want us to demonstrate it? Well, no, first let's define it. What do you think it is? Um, it's an open-ended question that uh, helps to narrow down the problem. Okay. Anyone else? Questions to pretty much find out, I guess, what they've said, the details of, of what the actual problem is. Okay. What, what are some things we would not want to do when going into, you know, making probing questions? Accusing the client. <laughs> That's definitely a good one. <laughs> Excellent. Yes or no questions. questions. Yes or no questions. All right. Nicole said being vague. Very good. Uh, Taking kind just of trying to explain it to us. We want to jump in there and just kind of complete sentences for them. No. No. Good idea. Make assumptions that you're like, oh, yeah, I know where you're going with this. I got this taken care of. And you also no. want to be careful not to ask questions that are directed towards the answer you think it already is. Yes, because then you would have a um, confirmation bias. You think you know what it is. So all of your questions are going to be guided in that exact direction. I like that. Very good. All right, um, try a little exercise here on Jamboard. See if we can give some examples of really of probing questions you might ask a customer if they called up and said, hey, my computer won't turn on. Is everybody able to get to the Jamboard? When did this start? That's a good one. Well, it hasn't started, that's why I called. So making any noise, that's another good one. What have you tried so far? That's excellent. That brings you right up to date as to what they might have already tried to troubleshoot. Did it happen abruptly? What was the situation when it occurred? When was the last time you used it? Because if, if they said, you know, I haven't turned my computer on in six months, that might be an issue. What are the problems have you noticed? Okay. Has this been going on for a while? Is the power plugged in? That would be a key one, wouldn't it? All right, some pretty good ones there. And sometimes you're going through the troubleshooting process and it, it you can't seem to put your finger on the issue. There was an example of this exact thing where a gentleman called into IT and was trying to get the computer to turn on. They couldn't figure it out, tried everything you could think of, couldn't get it to work. And then the technician asked, you know, can you know, you check the plug in the wall, but can you check, you know, 
walk around to the back of the computer and check the computer to see if the cable is snug in and stuff like that. And the guy goes, hold on, let me get a flashlight. And basically what the example was, the guy's power out was at his house. And that's why the computer wouldn't turn on. He had to get a flashlight to go around behind the computer to actually see because there were no lights in the room. That's hilarious. Yeah. So let me think here. If they called in and said, I can't get on the internet, what would be some questions you would ask? Same Jamboard. Can you repeat the question? If the customer calls in and says, hey, I can't get on the internet, every time I open up my Explorer, it just says, you know, page not found. Internet cable plugged in, there you go. If you have internet, that would probably be an important one. I'm seeing a lot of yes or no questions though. Yeah, that is true. These aren't probing questions. These are yes or no questions. When was the last time? You did <laughs> <laughs> See how the difference don't go on a second. Let's let's stop right there. If you guys don't mind, stop right there. Tell me what's the difference between these two questions right here that I'm about to put in the center. What's the difference? Whoa, 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 slow, slow down, guys. Wait, don't move anything. Leave it, leave it. I'm moving everything. Stop, stop. Thank you. Those are the two questions. What's the difference between these two questions? Oh, that's a good example. What's the difference? Have you paid your yes internet? Yes or no? Yes or no question. And then the other one's a probing question where uh, they get to answer uh, more than just a yes or no. Or it's not a yes or you no. You see question. how that person just asked the exact same question that this person did? But this one makes you think, well, this one's only a yes or no. That one's mine, by the way. That's why I was I had the same question, but I wanted to rephrase it into a way that couldn't be a yes or no. So we need to be very careful. Our yes and no questions could be good questions. It's how we rephrase them into an open-ended question or a probing question where it gets even better. And it's, it's going to make them think and it's, and it's going to give them a chance to actually react because of the fact that did you pay? Do you agree that if it says that I pay, I could say yes or no. Would I be right if I said yes? I, yeah, I did. But does that actually answer what you're looking for? It could be that I, I paid for it last month and I forgot to pay for it this month. Therefore, asking the question is when was the last time you paid for your bill? Now they start thinking about, oh, yeah, that's over 30 days ago. Oh, that might be the reason why I don't have it. Based on the other one just asked, did you pay? And uh, yeah, I paid. Just didn't know when. Good. It also considers the fact that it might take some time to process the payment. Exactly, too. Could have been that they cut it off, but they didn't receive the payment yet. But here's another couple of good ones, you know, what was happening when you la when you last were able to connect to the internet? Has something changed since the last time you were on the internet? Has someone else used your computer since the last time you were on it? Did this happen right after you rebooted? Okay. Any other? You know, what have you done so far to try to correct this issue? Walk me through the steps. You know, these would be good questions to kind of try to lead them, you know, give you a good idea as to what's already been done, even though if they've said they've done something, you still, it would be a good idea to go back and redo it yourself just to double verify. Let me know whenever you want to go back to the presentation. Yeah, let's go ahead and get back to the presentation. That was just kind of 
Okay. Getting uh, we're thinking about it a little bit. There we go. Let's see here. Natalio, can you please help out on this one? Um, yeah. Uh, client friendly language, asking probing questions. A probing question is a question that relates to what the client is saying, but that tries to get additional information. It is asking for more specific details to get a better and fuller picture of the issue. Asking good questions is a key communicating is a is key to communicating in a client friendly manner. Uh, by asking the right questions, you can improve communication by getting better information and building stronger relationships. It is important to ask good questions because the quality of the question will directly impact the quality of the answers. Very good. Just like we were talking about with the uh, gentleman who was talking with somebody about their computer not being able to start and the guy needing to go get a flashlight so he's able to see, you know, a good question would have been has anything changed like the power going out you know if you ask about <laughs> that's the a good one that's a good one. i love that one that's one of my favorite ones uh of uh troubleshooting 101 the guy has no idea why the computer's not working he's got no power in the house so, yeah so you, dude <laughs> and there i mean there was some there were some really good ones early on like uh a tech was working with a guy calls in and he said my cup holder on my computer is broken and typically you don't want liquids near your computer so people are trying to figure out you know was this a promotional deal you know what was going mm -hmm. on where where did this come from well, you know the, so the first questions. cup holder came out in 19 i think it was 90 something yeah i remember that yeah yeah that's true it and, was uh, that's true and then he was like, you know, where is this cup holder? You know, like, where does it attach and all that stuff? And he goes, well, you push a button and it comes out. And then you just put your cup on it. And that is the truth, my friends. That it's a is CD drive. Truth. Yes. It's a CD-ROM. You know how many people were using a CD-ROM like as a cup holder? A coffee mug. You know how many people were doing that? He's not lying to you, man. He was doing plenty of people. Because <laughs> especially the one that has the plastic tray that comes out. It yeah. looks so much like if it was a cup holder that they literally were putting there. Yeah. So when you are, you know, when you are working in IT, you will come across things where you know it will absolutely amaze you what some people will do. So, but in order to kind of get you down that path to be able to help them, you know, would you want to use language that's very heavily? Technical when talking with customers? No. When you're, when you're asking the questions, you know, like, you know, hey, um, when's the last time you refreshed your DHS server or DHCP server? Yeah. Would the customer understand that? Yeah, ID 10 tier. You know, so you'd want to, you know, simplify things a little bit and try to, you know, be able to explain it to them and ask them questions to where they can kind of, you know, get you to the right answer. All right. Let's see on this one. Let's see. Anne, can you please help out? You want me to the client uh, friendly language? Yes, ma'am. Um, asking probing questions. Imagine that you are standing on the street outside your house. A woman comes up to you and says, help, I can't find my hotel. You can see that she's holding a tote bag with the name of a hotel on it. You could assume that you know she is staying in that hotel and gives her and give her directions, but you know that good active listening means that you don't make assumptions. What type of questions should you ask this woman to make sure to help her the best way you can? All right. What's some examples of questions you could ask this 
this woman to help what, her out. What's the name what's of the, the, name hotel, of the you hotel you're staying? Okay. What if it's a common one, you know, like, a, you know, like a Hyatt? You ask which area it is in. About how far is the hotel from where we're at now? Well, she's asking you. She doesn't know. Um, I yeah, but sometimes they know. Them. But sometimes they answer if it's maybe it's ten minutes away, thirty minutes away. So you kind of gauge as to the distance. Okay, so I could see that. What else might me ask? The area you can ask what the hotel looks like. Do you have a receipt? Do you have a receipt? <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, gonna I work. Can, yeah, I can ask her. Uh, I see the tote you're holding has this name of the hotel. Is that the hotel where you're staying at, or is it a different hotel? Okay, that's a good idea. What if you're in like a metro area like Miami where you have hundreds of, of uh, suburb cities? Or like the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I think there's like a thousand cities that surround Dallas-Fort Worth. It's absolutely amazing how many little cities are around it. Hmm. Maybe what city is your uh, hotel? What part of town? What part of town is it? True. Any landmark? Landmarks, yeah. Very good. These would definitely be good, you know, good questions, Scotty. I mean, instead of just assuming, you know, hey, she's got a bag. I know it's two blocks over. Yeah, it's right there. You know, guide them down there. Then they get there and realize that, you know, it's actually in the wrong city. You know, they're five miles away. All right. Let's see. Shilo, can you please help me out? When you are talking with a client and trying to get as much information as possible to help that person with a problem, there will be even more questions you will need to ask. Imagine that a client comes up to you and says that this computer will not turn on. Even without considering what the specific problems might be, what type of questions might you want to ask Oh, we kind of did this one already, but I mean, we could go over some more if you want. You know, what other what other questions? Do you have? I want to know where that ice cream truck is at. Uh -oh. We're gonna pause up right around there, please, guys. If we can take. You just warmed up here, uh, Michael. Can you please assist, sir? Got it. Client-friendly language, asking probing questions. You always wanna ask as many specific questions as possible. Taking the time to actively listen and ask questions will ultimately save time and money. Your probing questions should be open-ended questions. You already learned about open-ended questions when we discussed troubleshooting. Open-ended questions will require your client to think, reflect, and provide you more information. Examples are, what happened after you rebooted or what did you try to do when installing the update? There you go, not being too specific, not asking yes or no questions, and most importantly, listen to what they're saying. Not thinking about what you're going to say next, but actively listening to see if there is critical information being given. Because if you're all you're doing is waiting for your turn to talk so that you can jump in and you know ask your next question on your script, you may miss very critical pieces of information to help you solve your client's problem. All right, on this one, Benjamin, can you please help? Um, asking probing questions. Uh, let's take this a step further. There are several categories of probing questions that you should consider asking your clients. Of course, you may not need to ask all these questions every single time, but you should consider them when speaking to your client and determine which ones you need to know to help you solve the problem. Um, what? What is wrong? What are details of what happened? When? When did it happen? How often? Has it happened before? Is there a pattern? 
why, why did it happen, where, in what location did it happen, how, how did it happen. Uh, remember these are, quest are just questions to consider. You may not ask all of them every time. Exactly, but there are times forgetting to ask them can absolutely be critical. You know, like my tablet isn't working anymore. I had it yesterday, it was working just fine. Um, but now today, I, I just can't seem to get it to turn on. Well, where was the last place you were using the tablet where it was working? Well, in the bathtub. You know, I mean, some of this stuff, if you forget to ask, you may miss critical points. Okay. Arturo. Can you please assist? Yeah. Um, asking probing questions. It is so important to actively listen to your clients and to ask them open-ended probing questions so that you can build good relationships and learn any important details. But your client won't, won't do all of the talking. You will also need to explain certain things to your clients. Sometimes you might just fix a client's problem. More often, though, you, you will talk a client through a situation that he or she will perform. Or even if you are directly fixing an issue, your client might, might want to know what you have done. In all cases, when you discuss issues with your client, client-friendly language will, will be especially important. What do you think client-friendly language means? All right. Um, who can give a good example of what they think client-friendly language means? What would you need to do? Not use technical jargon, explain it as simply as possible. Very good. Acknowledge the issue. Excellent. Uh, be attentive to their questions and or, or concerns. Absolutely. Also remembering the uh, exercise we just did with Diego drawing that fun caterpillar. Um, as wonderful as a tool as remote desktop is, oftentimes we won't be able to use that tool if they can't connect to the internet, if they're having power issues, things like that. So we're actually going to have to walk them through the steps of everything that they need to do. So we have to be able to explain it in such a way that it's easy to understand. It's, you know, quick and concise. They can follow our steps well and make sure that we're affirming that they're understanding exactly what we're telling them. You know, can you push the little button that looks like a window on your keyboard? Well, where's it located? Well, it's on the bottom, you know, bottom left-hand side. Are you able to locate it? You know, it's next to the control button. And, you know, they will affirm beyond that as they're giving instructions yes yes oh yeah yeah i found it i know where that is and uh you know make sure not to get too technical with your jargon what were the three types of languages we needed to learn to speak diego spoke about this earlier manager okay manager oh, work oh, and clients. manager client, client supervisor colleague. and colleague I'm talking to my colleague, exactly how am I going to be speaking with my colleague? Uh, pretty casually, like you would talk to maybe like a friend or so uh, with terms and like terminologies since they would also understand it. I'm probably going to be very specific and detailed and use the correct terminology for what you're trying to accomplish, correct? Yeah. So you're going to be very detailed and specific in how you speak to them. If you're speaking to a client, how are you going to be talking? Anything as simple as possible? Not necessarily as simple as possible, but at least, you know, try to gauge a little bit to their level of understanding and try to talk to the client. Because you will come across clients that actually are tech savvy and they might get quite frustrated with you if, you know, if you're speaking in extremely simple terms. So to a degree, you kind of have to feel out the client to understand their level of technical understanding. Now, if you're speaking to your manager, how are you going to be speaking? I mean, uh, pretty you know. formal. 
pretty formal. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what exactly are managers responsible for? What are they doing as a whole with the, with the company? Uh, they are essentially not assisting you, but they are sort of the gate that lets you um, sort of get like the materials you need and things like that. I don't know how to explain it. That's the best way. I can explain. The resources of the company. Yeah. They're, they're going to control, you know, whether you're going to get funding, whether you're going to get the software you need and all that stuff. Are they going to care about all the minute technicalities and technical jargon that you're going to be dealing with? Probably not. I mean, they're going, they basically want to know what resources, what resources do you need to be able to accomplish the task that I've assigned to you? You know, do you need to make do with what you have now? Or do I need to shift resources from another place to you to be able to accomplish the task you need? That's what they overall are, you know, care about. They may not really know all the minute details of what you do, but they understand the function you fulfill for that company. So they're looking for resource allocation. All right, let's see here. Elizabeth, can you please help out? Yes, a client-friendly language asking probing questions. Imagine that you are a medical doctor. You are doing some important and complex research on a rare disease. You have a colleague, a fellow surgeon, who wants to know about your research. You would explain your research to your colleague using very technical language and with as many details as you can. Now, imagine that you have a seven-year-old patient who has this disease. You are meeting with the patient and the patient's parent. You want to explain your research to see if they would be interested in joining your clinical trial. How would you need to explain your research to the patient and parent in a different way than you did to your colleague? Excellent. Anybody have any ideas? Avoid technical language and make it as simple as possible. There we go. A lot more empathy. Trying to probably be more about the functions of the body rather than specific um, mechanisms, like how it overall affects the body and what general parts are being affected. Giving them general, you know, success rates, maybe. This is an urgent reminder about your vehicle. Not sure who got that one. All right. This and lastly for this one, um, Robert, can you please assist? Asking probing questions. Uh... I would not use as many details as I did with my colleagues. I would use terms and examples that the patients and parents will understand. I would tell them the truth, but keep it simple and try to make analogies if possible. The screen just changed. I don't know how that happened. There you go. I would tell them the truth, but keep it simple and try to make analogies if possible to help them understand. When you are speaking with clients, you need to make sure to explain concepts to them in a way that they will understand using client-friendly language. We'll make sure that they understand that you both have overall strong communication. Excellent. Is it important to develop a relationship with your customer? I mean, I'm not necessarily saying you want to make them your best friend or have them over for dinner, but there needs to be a level of trust established, correct? Yeah, they should yes. at least be comfortable with yeah. you. So 
absolutely being able to explain it in terms they can understand if they are emotionally charged about it, very stressed out, you know, trying to reassure them that you're there to help them, that you're there to, you know, help the process go through. You're there with them for this process and you're, you're going to be there for the duration of it or hand them off to somebody who is, you know, capable of taking care of their issue. And uh, going right along that line, I'm going to hand you off to Lazaro as he can uh, take on the next section. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Let's see here. Let's do this device only. Actually, no, it won't work. I have to put all devices probably. Let's see. All right, let me make sure the video voice only goes to- Now, the funny thing, we had intended to do the same troubleshooting scenario as last time with just one stick of memory out. The problem is that some of our vendors, like Dell, only put one bloody stick of memory in the system, and that wouldn't be fair to them versus the ones that did install dual channel memory. Well, Okay, it's not working as it's supposed to work, but it was supposed to be a question that popped out. Let's see, question, who's controlling Nearpod right now? Yo. Okay. If you want a question, that would be next, no? A funny thing. Okay, let There's me nothing screen share here. it. Let me screen share it because mine's is working, but that one's not coming out correctly though. Okay, screen share, share with computer sound, and let's go try this again. Okay, so let's just try that again. Thing. We had intended to do the same troubleshooting scenario as last time with just one stick of memory out. The problem is that some of our vendors, like Dell, only put one bloody stick of memory in the system, and that wouldn't be fair to them versus the ones that did install dual channel memory. Uh, when you all right, we're gonna start the activity. So basically, this is a secret shopper. And the lady there called Sarah is having a problem with her computer calling tech support. How will you think the tech support will do with Dell based on his reaction? So far, I don't have any answers, but I'm just curious. Someone said bad, okay. Any others? Oh, a lot of people are saying bad. Okay, a lot of bad. No okay, no good. Okay, some people are saying okay, okay, all right. What about, okay, all right. Oh, one person said amazing, okay. Well, let's see how well they did. Let's take a look. Next question. When you start the computer, or, or do you at least see the Dell logo, ma'am? I mean, she did just tell him that the screen doesn't go on, so how would she see a Dell logo? I do see the Dell logo. Oh, no, yeah. Sarah, that's the wrong <laughs> Dell logo. Oh, okay, that's not... Oh, no. <laughs> um, sorry, I thought you meant the Dell monitor on the PC. I actually don't see the Dell monitor, or the Dell logo on the monitor. I mean, look. It's his job to help people like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unplug the uh, power cord from the back of the uh, computer tower. Okay, we're six and a half minutes in. We have an unplugged computer. Please press and hold the power button on the tower for one minute of time without the power cable. I'll let you know when to release it. She's still holding it. Oh my it. God, she's been holding it for two minutes. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Close it in. Let's start the next activity. Who here noticed the IT's tone of voice? Okay, a lot of neutral. I would agree, neutral. Bad? Well, okay. All right, good. Okay, someone said good. But the majority is neutral, it looks. All right. Who here thinks why it's so neutral? A little bit of a call out. Who thinks why it's so neutral? sounds really monotonous when he's talking. Like, it's just the same overall, like no emotion almost. No motion. He's calm though, is he not? Yeah. He's calm. She, she's not angry yeah, yet, calm. though, either. So that could not be angry, But who is angry? 
the one who bought the computer. Linus, that's his name. The guy who first slammed the test, his name is Linus. He's the one who bought that computer. He does not seem very happy, does he? <laughs> All right, let's continue the video. So you can see on this Dell, it actually uses an LED indicator for the BIOS error code. Uh, will you please tap the caps lock again on the keyboard and see if the caps lock comes on and goes off? But I mean, he just had her reset it to diagnostic mode. Why didn't he just have her look at the indicator light? I don't know. Give me the exact message board it shows. <sighs> yeah, so he's sure. asking still what? on the monitors. Our 16 how, minutes in. How are we still on the monitor? I mean, at the uh, behind the monitor, there'll be two oh. different display ports, ma'am. One is display My in. God. I hope it is connected to the DP in. We are yes, still it is. on the monitor. And he's saying there's display port out. Okay. There's no display, there's no port, display out. port out what monitor on has, any monitor. Yeah, which that one I'm aware has of. display port pass through? I can pretty much guarantee there is none. Behind the tower, uh, at the place the where you're connected, please check if there's any other port, any other display port. Which is not a terrible troubleshooting step. Yes, but this computer <laughs> only has one. I oh. think this GPU only had one display port, yeah, one HDMI, like right. a DVI. No, there isn't. Will you please connect? Look up the order. I think he did. And because, he's still reading off the same like He's still trying to tell, getting us to do things we don't have yeah. and asking wh what her name is. Not to mention it's Dell, so he has a service tag that should be leading him to the exact model. Usually in case if you put, I mean, if the monitor tower has a graphics card, then it will have a uh, different output, ma'am. This motherboard doesn't have onboard video ports. It doesn't have any other display ports either. There is one display port output. Um, it seems to be plugged okay, into Okay, so that we're one. 19 minutes in, still working on the monitor. All right, there's a reason why I wanted to show this video. How upset did the client seem? And this is Sarah specifically, when you saw the close up to Sarah. Do you think she was upset? All right, good, amazing. Oh, I got a lot upset. Seem all right, okay, all right. Okay, we got like down the middle. Okay. Okay, she seems all right. I don't know, if a client does this to me, does it look all right? While the person's talking with a neutral tone? Hmm. All right, let's, let's continue, we're almost done. Can I just say for a moment that it is filling me with rage to see this error code flashing on the front of the tower <laughs> yeah, the entire going. time we're sitting here? Yeah. It starts in the groin and it works its way up you to keep vomit. Your, keep your groin to yourself. What is he even waiting for for so long? Oh my God. Uh, oh, he's back. At the, I mean, uh, when I check my resources, I see there are a uh, few more display ports at the uh, oh, back. Oh, huh? no, no, no. Well, that's a good example of how to, I don't know, let's see, have an upset customer. A lot of upset customers. So we're going to be talking about how to address upset customers. As you can see in the beginning, Linus, which is the real customer, because he bought the computer and he's doing a secret shop, he was not happy from the beginning. They didn't give him the PC he wanted. They he already had issues with the RAM. And now his employee, Sarah, is doing the tech call to see how well they do. And he was not happy at all with the service. Long wait time. And it kept being fixated on the monitor. Monitor this, monitor that. Kind of like a fixed mindset. It has to be that. Not moving on or adapting and not even listening that well to the client. So I want you guys to think of, just like that video saw, what do you think is something you might do differently when assisting an upset client? What will you do, for example, in that video different? Who wants to share out on that? Well, for sure, not sound so monotone and dead over the phone. I would agree. I wouldn't like anybody talking to me that out of interest. Sure, you're calm, but it doesn't seem you're interested either. It seems like the problem was a little bit above his like understanding. I would have just elevated that ticket if I couldn't figure it out based on the scripts and the information I was given. Okay, that's that's interesting. Who else has one more they want to think of differently based on the scenario we just had? 
especially using what we learned that Kelly and Diego was teaching us about friendly communication with our clients. Yeah. You could probably you ask more probing questions. Ah, you hit it right there. Ask probing questions. I believe if the technician from Dell asked a proper question of probing saying, hey, what's really going on with the computer versus let's go through a script and keeping stuck on a monitor, for example. That would have been a great way to start. So let's move to the next part. And now we're gonna talk about the nine steps of addressing clients that are upset. You got one, remain calm, which a technician did. Don't take it personal, which a technician also did. And it's very good that we mentioned that very deeply. Never be offended. Do the best you can and don't take it personal. Use your listening skills, just like we taught today when we're playing the drawing game. Use the best drilling skills you can. Show that you heard what the client said. Improvise. Sorry. Express sympathy. Apologize gracefully. Find a solution. Start the solution in motion and communicate appreciation. These are all little things we're going to now break up and use the video. The video that I had is going to be something I like to mention a lot. So the video, the technician was very calm. This is good. You always want to be calm. It's important to also mention that you want to be able to control your breathing as well. That will help you stay less stressed. So if you ever find yourself in a hard situation, try your best to remain calm by deep breathing or maybe give yourself a few seconds somehow. You can always tell the client, hey, can you please give me one moment? Try to put them on hold, take a breather. Sometimes you just need to take a very small break to reset your mindset and get back into it. And then of course, number two, which is probably in my opinion, the hardest step is don't take it personal. The client may see some really mean things to you, really mean, but remember, they're more angry about the situation and what has happened to them than you. So don't take it personal, even if they want to take it personal. You just don't take it personal. Remember you're there to help them. And you can always go back to step one to remain calm if things just don't turn out too well. And then step three, you want to listen. It may be difficult to listen what they're going to tell you if they're very angry. Trust me on that. But as long as we say calm, we don't take it personal. We have the ability to listen to what is their issue. So we both understand and better handle the current situation. We show them that we care about their problems as well. By listening, we can find a solution for the technical issue and the client's emotional state, which also goes to step four, making sure they have heard that we had took in their questions that we asked them for consideration. And also more importantly, we listened to their concerns. So you can always reinstate their concern back to them. So you make sure it's correct. Like when you ask those questions in the Diego game, as I like to call it, we have to draw. You guys ask questions about how big should the circle be? How small should the circle be? That is part of this step where you have to make sure you tell the client, oh, is the computer not working? Oh, so it looks like the monitor is not coming up. Rephrase, nicely as possible as well, calm, yet not too dead, like the technician did. Over here, five is expressing sympathy. In the video, can anybody here tell me if the technician was showing any sympathy? No. No. And the reason why? It's just because you wanted to read the script and because I saw the whole video, it was actually messaging one of his other level two support. In other words, another coworker trying to help him with Sarah's issue. He's not playing, he's not using customer focus at that point. He is too fixated on, okay, I don't know what to do here. Sure, you should exhalate it, but he's not talking back to the client, which is step four. And worst of all, He's not showing any sympathy. You want to make sure that you tell the client, hey, remember, you don't want to blame anybody, but you can always tell the, uh, the client that 
you're very sorry about their situation. You let them know that, hey, I'm here to help you. This is not easy. Versus, okay, I'm going to put you on hold and try to contact my coworker. Did anybody see how long that call was? Anybody yes. notice how long that call was? They said it was, it was like 60 minutes. minutes or something, right? Two hours. If I saw that clock right, it was a two hour call. The video that he was looking at was a two hour video. And amazingly, apparently that system had a, a GUI interface in the front, which gave him the error that he needed. And he never bothered to ask if she saw that code in the front. I don't know if you guys saw that he kept on beating the desk and saying, it's there, the darn errors on the case. Because basically all, he, all she had to do is look in the front. I guess there was some type of digital display that had some error code there. If she would have gave him that, it would have been more than sufficient. Second, the guy never even bothered to look up the computer, apparently, because as we all, if he ever got in a Dell, it has a service tag, which says exactly every single piece. The picture comes up. This is how wonderful it is. I don't know if you guys ever been in a help desk, but I've been in these help desks. So as soon as you get the model, the motherboard, every single little piece of that computer is on your screen. If, if the call center is even as good as what the one that I was in, if you're calling in with your phone, your physical phone that's registered, I have your computer that comes up right on my screen or all of the computers that you bought from me. So this agent, as we saw, was not even trying his best. <laughs> he was stuck out along like half an hour on a monitor just to see if he can get that monitor. Didn't even ask for beep codes because obviously if I understood correctly, it seemed not to even give anything on the display. That's correct. And eventually he did get to the beat code, but I think it was in the 25 or 30 minute mark. 30 minutes uh, before you asked for a beat code. Yeah, that, that, that'll that get you. A probing question would have helped here versus is your computer on? Yes or no? Versus do you see anything or hear anything strange from your computer? And if you do, what is it? Starting from a yes or no to then asking specifically, what is it? Much better. And then did the client even gave a genuine apology, a graceful apology. That's number six of our step here. Did he apologize at all from what we heard? Not from what we heard. No. I, still, I see a lot of people no. saying no, a lot of head shaking. Even if you're not a fault. And remember the, the skill that we learn, personal responsibility. You want to make sure you let the client know, hey, I'm genuinely sorry about your situation. Specifically that word, your situation. But I'm here to help the best I can. Even if it's not your fault, you let them know I'm here to help. And one thing I just want to notice, I'm going to skip here quickly. Step seven, eight and nine is the solution. Step one all the way to step six is addressing the client's emotional state. So two thirds of the step is making sure the client is doing well mentally. In other words, we're addressing how upset they are. So it's very important you address that the best you can first before you go to the solution. And then that's the big part, the big meat and potatoes. We try to find out, hey, what the client told us, what can we use? What are the options we have? Can we do the best we can to satisfy them? What solutions do we have? I watched the video and by the way, after who knows how long she waited, they never fixed the issue. And the only solution they offer is to, to shift the computer hole back to the depot. In other words, she will have to wait two weeks, Mrs. Days, two weeks to get her computer back fixed, which by the way, they, all they needed to do is reset the RAM and it would have been fixed. That's a good example there. Not a good solution, but at least you can try to find the best solution what you have. So that's step seven. You gotta find your best to find a solution that client will be happy. And then step eight is you start doing action. You find a solution. All right, this is a solution we can offer. You put it in action, you set it. Or are we gonna give them a new part? Are we going to send a technician to repair it? Are we going to tell the client, hey, sorry, we can't help you with this? 
All of those things need to be in motion. Hopefully not the last one I said, we can't help you. It should be, we will find a way. And then the last one is basically a summary of everything of communicating to clients to appreciate their time and let them know, hey, you had this issue. I'm so sorry that the computer wasn't working. We're gonna send you new RAM to fix the computer. I hope this will help. And on top of that, when it, the shipment comes in, we will call you up for follow-up to make sure everything is working and you also make sure everything is done professionally. From being calm, being empathetic, apologizing about the situation, and making them happen. Those are the key things you gotta do, and then make sure you communicate at the end to the client that thank you, and you say thank you again if you can, and then you go from there. All these things are important. So, what are the key elements of client-friendly communication? I'm gonna call out, hmm, who hasn't been called out yet? Let's go walk in. What are the key elements of friendly communication? Uh, smile. Smile, yes, smile would be good. Spot would be excellent, I would agree. Using spot, smile, present. Offer Present the help. yourself, offer the help, and thank that's, you. Yes, that's good. And then now we're going to talk about the nine steps to assist the upset client. I'm going to call, cold call people. The first one, Michael, what is the first one of a cold call? Sorry, I said it wrong. What's the first step of assisting an upset client? Introducing yourself and getting, asking questions. Hmm, that would be a good strategy, but that's not a, the first step, though. Being calm. How calm was the technician in the video, Michael? Uh, um, trying to think. Um, introduce yourself. Okay. The first step to assisting an upset client would be staying calm. Oh, staying calm. Yes. Yes. We're first getting mentally ready to, to handle the client. That is a good step. That is true. That's something you should do. You introduce yourself. But before you do, you check yourself. Am I calm? Yes. Let's proceed. All right. I'm going to call, call the next person for step two. Kevin, what's the second step? Uh, listen. I would listen. That is a skill for friendly communication. But this is referring to upset clients. The nine upset steps, guys. Remember, so we're, I remain calm and I'll give you a hint. It's your fault. So what should I do? Don't if it's your apologize. Fault, don't take it personal. There we go. Somebody there remember that go. sentence. Don't let them get to you. Remember, the situation is evolving their issue, not you. And remember, if somehow it gets to you, go back to step one. Get calm, take a deep breath, try to put the person on hold so you can take that breather and then go right back into it. All right, let's give another call for number three. Robert, what do you think is the third step for assisting an upset client? The third step. Um, be transparent. Okay. Being transparent, but that's not a step that we need to do for the third one. I'll give you a little tip. It has to do with hearing out somebody. Uh, listening skills. Listening. There you go. Yes, we got to listen to the client. Now, we're going to get moving on, and I'm going to tell the next steps. The fourth one is show what you've heard what the client said, empathize, apologize gracefully, find a solution, and then start the solution in motion. So it was a good job. Um, let's see, Diego, do you think we have enough time to role play? I would say that's up to you guys if you want to do the role play and still have enough time. I know that you guys do have another role play this afternoon that's still pending. And two role plays and a case study that is pending. Okay. So, so 
I'm going to skip to. this actually because we do have another role play. Mm -hmm. And you can always ask questions to us if you have any questions about these steps as well. Me, Kelly, Diego, Marvin, and Justin are more willing to help you if you have any questions about them. All right. So we're skipping this game and we're going to just debrief right over here. I'll give it back to Diego. Thank you. So a needle pulling thread, as I like to say, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you did enjoy this little presentation that we give. Somebody please push me forward. I had to restart my computer, so I am not in that near pod screen, but you should be able to see that one. Push me one forward, please, towards the end, until the end. Thank you. In this session overall, we should have awfully been able now to be able to decipher the best way to communicate with our clients in a friendly and kind, unintimidating way. Hopefully not like this and not sounding at all concerned. I can care less about my accent. It's the tone and voice that is a problem. Managing all types of kinds of clients is critical for ourselves. At this point, we should be able to demonstrate that Active listening is by nodding our heads, making sure that we're making our eye contact, paraphrasing what the clients has said overall, making sure that we do ask our probing questions, be open-ended instead of yes or no, explaining our concept clear, concise, in a client-friendly language, and lastly, hopefully be able to demonstrate the nine steps that are involved when assisting an upset client. As we learn, spot comes into play at the beginning of this. Yes, we have smiled, we presented offer, but then at that point, if and when that happens that we have identified an upset uh, client, I was about to say an upset stomach, something like a commercial here, we need to make sure that we do our nine steps, which is obviously to remain calm, do not ever, ever take it personal, Use your listening skills. Show that you have heard what the clients said by being able to paraphrase briefly what they explained. Express sympathy when necessary. Apologize gracefully and sincerely. Do not blame anyone in your apologies. You're not going to blame them. You're not going to uh, blame anyone. I'm sorry that you don't know how to download that file. Did that sound right? If I told you that, I apologize. I'm sorry you, that you don't know how to download the file. Did that sound no. right? No, you're placing blame. No, not at all. Yeah, I do apologize something. that you're having issues downloading this file. Let me see what I can do to help you. Did that sound better? Yes. Yeah. We need to be very careful in the way we express things because a lot of times we get tired and we do obviously understand at that point it was an ID 10 T error because I'm noticing that the guy maybe just doesn't notice that the little icon is down there and it's in his download folders and God only knows he keeps on clicking to download, download, and he's got 50 downloaded files. Sorry, I feel better. It happened to me. But either which way, I didn't tell him that he just didn't know what he was doing. I just asked him in a nice, friendly way to obviously try to alleviate the issue. We're not gonna blame anyone, not even the user themselves at any point. Questions or concerns on this before we complete this one? All right, stop the recording here. Question here on chat though. Okay, go ahead. All right, question is, is that allowed to communicate clients with a language they understand apart from English? Who, what, when, how? Repeat that question. Is that allowed to is communicate that allowed? clients? Is it allowed? Okay, is it allowed to communicate with a client with the language they understand apart from, apart from English? From... That it all depends on the policies and procedures of your company. For example, when I was in UPS, I was able to speak freely Spanish, English, Portuguese, if I knew French, I was allowed to speak it. As long as I, it was the language that the customer was speaking to me, there was no issues speaking their language. Now, put yourself in Broward, take yourself out of Miami-Dade, and you have a 99% chance that that's not an acceptable language. You might have to speak the English language. 
that is all depending on the call center that you're in. I could only imagine, obviously, that a lot of them nowadays are allowing you to speak the language that the client is speaking. Once again, policies and procedures are in place to be able to help you decipher and answer that question. Good one. Any other ones? All right, 